This is his Old and New Testament, okay? That's why he's got the, the, the guns he has. This is mine. Look at the difference there. It's not enough just to be Orthodox today. It's not enough just to have the right answers. It's not enough just to toe the party line. Like, do we really know Jesus from the inside out? Have we really encountered the faith as a living reality? And have we imbibed it to such an extent that we can pass it on with joy? So, so I, and again, if we're gonna read this as Bible, as Word of God, mm -hmm. it's not just about the past, and it's not just a history book. It's about how is this a mirror for my life in the present? Yeah. And how can I live with that kind of urgency in mind you're talking about? Before we begin, we'd like to thank today's sponsor, Sanctified. Click on the link to find out more. You know, when we study the Bible timeline, we're getting the basic story of salvation history. We're getting uh, kind of the, the train tracks to the story. We're not going into a whole lot of detail, but we feel that it's very important to know the basic structure of the story, and then we'll, we'll add to it and add to it and add to it. And so at this period now, everything is going to change. Everything is going to change. The period prior to this was the Tan period, and that was the desert wanderings of Israel, 40 years in the wilderness. And that was a kind of a rough time after they came out of Egypt. Now they are getting ready to go into the promised land, and they are going to conquer it. And then they're going to go through a period where there's not going to be any central leadership anymore, and they're, they're going to get themselves in a little bit of trouble. But think of it this way. They have been in the wilderness now for 40 years, okay? Mom and dad have most likely died off in the wilderness. We've had this great leader by the name of Moses, but we're going to lose Moses. Moses is going to stay on the eastern side of the Jordan. That's where he is going to pass away. And then we are going to go into the land under the leadership of Joshua. When they go into the promised land under the leadership of Joshua, they're going to take Jericho. And then they're going to attempt to take a little city by the name of Ai. And then they're going to basically, basically they're going to take the land in the north and the south, but not utterly take the land. And the reason for that is God wants them to, to rely upon him. And so they still have some problems in the land once they're there. They're going to divide the land up by uh, tribal allotments. They're going to give 48 cities to the Levites, Ephraim, Manasseh, those half-tribes of Joseph. They're going to get property as well. But the big thing that they're going to be facing is they don't have any central leadership anymore. And when Joshua dies, wow, they're really in some trouble. Good to have you. It's great to be here, Jeff. Well, I, I'm so glad you're here. Um, and you've got the background to answer some of the difficult questions we're going to be facing. <laughs> Israel is now going to be coming across the, yeah. the, the river. They have been in Egypt for 400 years, the wilderness for 40 years. Mom and dad died in the desert. Yeah. Our leader's gone, Moses. Yeah. Yeah. Who's Joshua? Oh, the Joshua? Joshua's going to take us over. And when we get over there, we're going to what? And that's where we pick up. Yeah, this is in many ways is, if not the question, it's one of the big, big questions. And I think it's easy for a lot of us deep down, we're kind of Marcionites inside, that ancient heresy that said, oh, maybe I'll take the New Testament and Jesus, but Old Testament, no, that's mm -hmm. a different God. That's and, and the church has always rejected that. And we mm -hmm. won't kind of dig into why is that the case and how do we understand these passages? So let's just say up front, these are really hard. Um, this is, this, I mean, and, and this isn't a new problem. This is something that um, the earliest doctors and saints also struggle with it and, and kind of, we, they can help us and be guides for us here. Um, I would maybe make, uh, if I could just make three points to kind of kick it off, and mm -hmm. but maybe one is like a preliminary. Um, one of the uh, professors I studied with in grad school is a guy named Kay Lawson Younger, and he did his dissertation on comparing Joshua to late second millennium uh, war conquest accounts in, in this period. And what basically he found, and others have seen, is that the kind of war rhetoric that was common of the day shows up in Joshua. And so you got to be careful not to take everything literalistically. Uh, sometimes when it says, you know, we, we killed everybody, it doesn't literally mean everyone. It's sort of like, oh, man, we, we, we destroyed that team on Sunday. Well, I mean, no one died, right? So now, that doesn't mm -hmm. fix all the problems. It's, there's still some hard issues, but, but a lot of this has, is war rhetoric, hyperbole that was common of the day. 
But maybe the three points that I'd make. Um, one, if you read Numbers 21 closely, uh, which is really where the conquest actually begins, and you might have heard of Sion and Og, um, mm-hmm. these kings that show up in, in like Psalm 135, for example. Uh, if you read Numbers 21 closely, there is actually a defensive aspect. These kings actually attack Israel first. So again, it doesn't fix the problem. It's just worth noting that when Israel first goes in in Numbers 21, they're actually attacked first and they, they respond. Um, two, and I think this, um, we need to kind of dive into the biblical world. There is this um, sense, this analog in Israel's scriptures in the Old Testament, and it shows up in the New as well, that sin is analogous to debt. Uh, think about the Our Father in Matthew. Forgive us our debts. Mm-hmm. And there is a sense in which when the debt hits a certain limit, when the sin hits a certain limit, the creditor steps in and judgment comes. And I think this is part of the story. I was going to read a passage from sure. Genesis 15. Uh, it's when the covenant with Abraham is first, um, when the covenant is made, and there's a prophecy of the, uh, the bondage in Egypt, mm-hmm. and then the exodus, and then the conquest. And you have this line in verse 16 that goes like this. Um, so know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there and they will be afflicted for 400 years. So you mentioned the bondage. But I will bring judgment on that nation that they serve and afterward they shall come out with great possessions of the despoiling of Egypt. Uh, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age and they shall come back here in the fourth generation. And here's the line. For, quote, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. The iniquity Mm. of the Amorites is not yet complete. And so there's a sense in which the conquest is only going to come when that the debt of sin reaches a certain limit. And and, and again, this is super hard. I mean, for a lot of the Bible, God raises up foreign armies, Babylon, Assyria, to bring judgment upon his own people. And what emerges here is Israel as the instrument of judgment uh, against the Canaanites. And, And I think... Again, this doesn't fix it all, Uh, but the Canaanites from the text, they're not innocent um, in terms of lots of sexual deviancy, uh, but child sacrifice Mm -hmm. and things like that. So this is part of the story. Um, And the flip side of this sin is debt. If you look at a passage like 2 Maccabees chapter 7, verse 37 and 38, this is when those seven brothers are martyred and you have the mother standing there and uh, she really prefigures Mary, blessed mother, before Jesus' passion. Mm-hmm. And the seventh brother basically says, um, you know, we're going to be faithful. We're, we're going to give our lives for the faith of our fathers. And that through our deaths, we'll be an atoning, redemptive. So in other words, if sin is debt, there's a sense in which good works, meritorious works done in faith and charity and love become credit or redemptive or meritorious. That's like the flip side. And I'll also throw out, Even in Jesus' words, if you were to read like Matthew 23, verses 31 and 32 and following, this is when Jesus has that final standoff with the Pharisees. And he says, you are sons of your fathers who killed the prophets. And then Jesus says in verse, it's in verse 31, fill up then the measure of your fathers. And and, and that's setting up the judgment that's going to come upon Jerusalem. So there is this deep sense in scripture that sin is is analogous to debt. Mm -hmm. And when the debt reaches a certain limit, the creditor, i.e. God, steps in and and, and brings judgment. And so there's a sense in which that's what's happening in the narrative with the Canaanites. The difference is Israel is the instrument, whereas in many other places, it's a serious yeah. Babylon. And in some ways, you know, there's different stories in the Bible where it it's, doesn't seem as as intense as, as this, mm-hmm. but that there is a time yeah. where judgment takes take place. And we don't want to think about that, mm-hmm. um, but it is part of the story. Um, the third thing I'd say, just to kick us off, that I think may be the most important, though, um, is basically what we would call the allegorical or even the anagogical sense. Uh, just as the old prefigures and foreshadows the new, there's also a deep sense in which the earthly prefigures and foreshadows the heavenly. Um, St. Augustine, if you read the Confessions, his, his great story, and this is, I love to read this with students. Um, if you look at the end of book five, St. Augustine tells us there were many passages in the Old Testament Mm-hmm. that presented an obstacle for him to come back to faith. He says, the Old Testament, I just it, it just got me stuck. So again, if you, if you felt like that, like you are in good company. His Manichaean phase, uh, he said, the Old Testament uh, posed a big problem. And it wasn't until Bishop Ambrose, St. Ambrose, taught St. Augustine to read the Old Testament spiritually. 
it was a huge, removed a huge obstacle for him to come in back into the fold. So um, this is, God does not reveal himself fully all at once. And even the catechism passage 122 um, speaks of some passages in the Old Testament that are imperfect and provisional. Like we have to kind of reckon with what, what does that mean? Um, but this is, God is meeting his people where they are, the thinking in earthly terms. Um, the promised land becomes a foreshadow, a type of heaven itself. And so, and even Joshua's name, Yehoshua in Hebrew, but in, if you were reading the Greek Old Testament, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. Mm-hmm. And so as just as, as Joshua leads them across the Jordan River into the promised land. The promised land is a type of heaven. And those battles fought to attain the promised land prefigure the spiritual struggles we all must undergo right. to attain the ultimate promised land. And, and even, you know, to kind of put two points two and three together, um, in the Pentateuch, the death penalty is generally reserved for direct infractions against the Ten Commandments. That really is a foreshadowing of what we call mortal sin, right? Physical death spiritual death. Mm -hmm. The promised land is a type of heaven. Um, So there's lots more to say, but to read all this, read the earthly in light of the heavenly. um, So just to kind of recap, Numbers 21 shows us there is a defensive aspect to this. They really are attacked first. Yeah, but Um, just pause it for a second. You mentioned uh, um, Sion and Og. They're on the eastern side of the Jordan before they're going to come across into into Jericho. And that was that was a, I think an attempt to stop them, and and then yeah. Israel defeated them. Mm-hmm. Uh, a carrier pigeon got word to Jericho, <laughs> and they're actually right. frightened. Right, right. They're frightened, which is interesting because at the beginning of the of the desert wanderings, twelve spies were sent up, and the ten spies were frightened. Right, right. We were frightened. Right. And now forty years later, they're frightened. Right. So you have. You have the uh, the two kings that are defeated over on the eastern side, but you mentioned something. I just want to clarify this for all, all of our our, our uh, listeners. You mentioned the allegorical sense. You mentioned the anagogical sense, mm-hmm. and there's one more in there, which is the moral mm-hmm. sense. And so, what what uh, Dr. Swafford is saying is that when you look at the the uh, harem warfare, when you look at the fall of Jericho. Do what St. Augustine did, read it with an imagination, and in the, in the spiritual senses, the allegorical is how does it relate to Christ? You mentioned that with Joshua. Right. Number two, moral sense, how does it relate to me in yes. my life? And number three, the anagogical sense, you mentioned going forward, heaven. Yes. And so yeah. those three things that uh, Dr. Swafford is mentioning can become very valuable tools in your toolbox as you continue to read. Go ahead. You know, and just to piggyback on what you're saying here, and you can find this in origin, third century. So this is not like a new thing. This is how this is how the early church read scripture in light of Christ and Christ crucified. Origin would think of the Canaanites as embodying various deadly sins that need to be killed, completely mm-hmm. eradicated from our lives. And, and I think we can maybe make one more point here. So harem, haram in Hebrew, many scholars see this as, uh, and you kind of pointed this, this is sort of total dedication to the Lord here in a destructive way. It, it really has some connections to the olah, the burnt, the whole mm-hmm. burnt offering. So it's the sacrifice in ancient Israel that the whole thing is burnt up and, and sacrifice really is ritualized self-offering. So the whole burnt offering really embodies this total gift of self. And, and you might think of the harem thing spiritually in the same way that I want to give the Lord I want to make my life a living sacrifice, as St. Paul says. Um, and that means, part of that means, I mean, conversion is always turning away from sin and toward God. I need to put the ban, the harem, the total eradication upon all the sin and the attachments that, that are taking me away from the Lord. I need to destroy those utterly. And we can see the Canaanites embodying those yeah. so that I can fully give myself to the Lord. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll throw you a little bit of a curveball. I know you can... Uh, handle it, because I I understand there's a DR before your name. But uh, in the Old Testament, we read that about the fall of Jericho. But then in this, you mentioned this Marcion heresy. Bad bad God in the Old Testament, good God in the New Testament. That's heresy. We We don't believe that. But when we come to the New Testament, people have a hard time believing that someone would uh, hear Jesus say, go in there and destroy. The city. In fact, right. the sons of Zebedee said, "He wants to call down. He <laughs> wants to call down lightning, <laughs> right. thunder from heaven, whatever. Yeah. Call down fire from heaven." And yeah. Jesus, time out. Right. No. Right. Well, is it 
Jericho or is it thunder and fire coming down from heaven? You know, which, what's it going to be here? What's the difference? Yeah, no, I, I, it's great, great questions. Um, we're kind of pointing toward like lines to begin understanding this, but it doesn't make it all go away. Um, but I, I think it's important that the fathers love to speak about divine pedagogy. Um, the God, just like we, you, know, you would teach your grandkids or your, your little mm-hmm. kids, you have to speak to them in a certain way. So God meets his people where they are, and he slowly and gradually unveils the fullness of who he is, the fullness of his plans for us. Right. So just, just, I mean, even like the afterlife. The afterlife, you can find passages in the Old Testament, but it's not, it's not fully explicit uh, until later books in the Old Testament, or, or really, it, it doesn't become predominant until the New Testament in many ways. And so imagine if you weren't sure about the afterlife. Imagine if the most important thing would be, in your mind, being safe on the land and defeating your enemies. Um, in a way, being kicked off the land, the exile, kind of like the great divorce in C.S. Lewis here, becomes kind of an image of hell for those who don't return and maybe purgatory for those who do. So that's kind of what I'm getting at. That to read, not the, I think of it typologically, the old in light of the new historically, moving horizontally, mm-hmm. but also a vertical typology, the earthly in light of the heavenly. Mm-hmm. Um, but you're, you're right. It's hard to imagine Jesus saying, do this. Yeah, you it, do see in the New Testament, you see, just uh, inter- interject there, uh, in the Old Testament, you do see a lot of mercy in the Old Testament. In the New Testament... The Lord you, is my shepherd, I shall not want. Like yeah, yeah. Is, right? You do in the New Testament see with Jesus some serious judgment. There's going to be judgment. And he talks, he mm-hmm. talks about it. And in, even in the book of Acts... And, and people lying to the Holy Spirit. Yeah, and an you know? and Sapphira, yeah. Right. And so you take it all, you take it, like you just said, you, you take it all, and you can see this, this like God is like a, like a diadem, so many angles and yeah. so many points of, of light there. And that if you just focus on Jericho and you just see Jesus in the New Testament with a lamb around his neck and say, but there's yep. much more to this. And I think one other aspect is we live in the West in such an individualistic culture, mm-hmm. right? And this shows up in Christian categories of it's just about me and Jesus. It's not about <laughs> anybody else. And the ancient world, the Bible's just not like that. There's a corporate and collective mm-hmm. sense. And that, that can show up in a positive way and a negative way. I mean, think about Noah. Um, think about Abraham. By the righteous of one, many are saved, right? The righteous of one. Think about Rahab. In Joshua, her yeah. whole family is saved because of her righteousness. So the righteousness of one can spill out for others. Mm-hmm. But negatively, there is this sense in which um, we stand and fall as a people. And so one of the hard things in the book of Joshua is, well, okay, even if there's war rhetoric and hyperbole, and even things like, if you read really closely, only three cities are said to be burned. It's Jericho, I, and Hotsor. Uh, so it's important not to read like a car- think of it as a cartoon version where they just destroyed everybody. It's like that's not what happened, and and that's actually how Joshua and Judges fit together. That it, it some of this is war rhetoric and hyperbole, and is not as devastating as it might seem at first glance. Um, but even so, even so, it's hard mm-hmm. to read that and not assume that at least some innocence. There's a sense of which. Um, the faithfulness of the leaders, later on the Davidic kings of ancient Israel, that impacts everybody down below. And so even if people are innocent, they're sort of brought into uh, mm-hmm. the collective impact there. of their solidarity with their leaders. Yes. Yeah. That is something that I just think people don't, they fail to see that. Mm-hmm. That it should be this person, that person, move aside your Israel. Okay, that person. Right. But it is a community. Right. And the, the innocent die. With the unrighteous, and that is that's that's true today, too, yeah. as as well. Now, when when we when we look at that in this destruction of Jericho, I got to ask you: Is that Plan hmm. A, or is it Plan B? I've heard of two different plans here. You tell me. <laughs> or D, E, F, or G, yeah, right? Yeah. No, no. There, there's, I mean, so there definitely is some movement. So if you look at, if you look carefully at when they get to Mount Sinai, they come out of Egypt, they're called to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. Mm-hmm. After the golden calf, like in Exodus 34, verse 11 and following, now they're, now it, it's, it's the ante's up. It's now it's, okay, you need to go in and destroy their altars. If you look after Baal Peor in Numbers 25, so if you, if you, like Numbers 33, for example, verse 50 and following, mm-hmm. uh, now it's destroy their altars and drive them out. And it's only in Deuteronomy that you get any discussion about harem warfare, about, about killing 
the Canaanites. And, and this is another really important point um, because think about our Lord. Um, so remember the divorce thing. So divorce shows up in Deuteronomy 24 and the Pharisees approach Jesus in Matthew yeah. 18. And they say, well, Moses gave it. And, and Jesus says, for your hardness of heart, Moses mm -hmm. gave you this command. So it's provisional. But in the beginning, it was not. So there's a real sense in which Deuteronomy represents a lower law. Right. And this is an important part of the and story. And a, and a self-retiring law when Jesus comes. Right, right. So it's just for a while. So, yeah. so what, the, what the leadership was doing with Jesus was they were appealing to a law that was given because of the hardness of your heart. Precisely. You had such a hard heart, God had to allow something that isn't the best. To give you a lower lay. As Ezekiel, Ezekiel 20, God gave them laws that were, quote, not good, low toe. Yeah. Uh, so what does Ezekiel mean? But this is the kind of thing he yeah. means. This is sort of a concession, a plan B, C, maybe even G or you know, H at this point, right? Mm -hmm. Because of the hardness of Israel's heart. Mm -hmm. uh, would that they could be like to the nations, but... When they're with the nations, they become like them. Yeah, you know what I've I've thought about I've thought about this story long and hard. I've you know teaching for years, and and I get that question all the time too, mm -hmm. or the scripture that you dash the babies against the stone. Mm -hmm. and these types of words that are they're embellished to make the point, right. you know. And I thought to myself, you know, if God went into Jericho, and Jericho was destroyed because of the unrighteousness, why do I think that? I would be right in saying, well, that shouldn't have happened. What if it happened, which we believe, and it happened for a reason? What's my position now? Well, my position is to discover the reason, not to argue with, well, according to the United States standards in the year 2000 so-and-so, right. this would have been a war crime. And blah, blah, blah. That is what happened back then, and I have to accept this. And I have to find out, like, like St. Augustine, Lord, what are you saying? You're, you're more serious than we thought about this. What does St. Paul say? The wages of sin is, is death. And, we mm -hmm. don't, we, and I think every generation, every age has certain parts of Revelation that are more bracing and mm -hmm. harder to, you know, and some that fit nicely in our own earthly categories. Yeah. And this is, this is one that just runs right up against our modern sensibilities. And I, mm -hmm. I recognize that it's, it's extremely hard for that reason. Let me, let me throw one other, uh, I think, kind of application thing. Um, and you already see this throughout, uh, Exodus 14, 14 is one of my favorite passages where you get this theme of the Lord is the divine warrior that he fights our battles for us. Right. We have to only be still. And you look at Jericho, I mean, okay, we're gonna have seven priests march around the city seven times with the Ark of the Covenant and blow the trumpets and that's how we're gonna win this. I mean, this is not your typical warfare. This is a liturgical, and spiritual battle. And when you read Joshua, it's very clear that it's only when they're faithful that there's any success. Like their strength is not in their numbers, it's not in their jujitsu, it's not in any earthly prowess, it's their faithfulness because the Lord fights their battles. Now what's the lesson for us? The Lord fights our battles. Mm -hmm. It's not our own concoction, our own manipulations, our own, no, no, it's, it's ultimately a surrender to the Lord and allowing him to write straight with our crooked lines. Yeah, and if we really look at that battle at Jericho, it is a liturgical war. If you, if you read, it's like Jehoshaphat. You know, when Jehoshaphat was surrounded by, was it three armies? And he said, we don't know what to do, but my eyes are upon you, our yeah. eyes are upon you. And then God causes them to fight against one another. Yeah. And there's, there's Jehoshaphat. And who's the new Ark of the Covenant? Yeah. It's our Blessed Mother. I mean, think yeah. about how powerful Our, our Lady is mm -hmm. in spiritual warfare today. When you read the, you know, you read Joshua 6, you read about the Ark, you read about Jericho, think, and think in, in, in when, you know, the trumpets show up in Revelation, Revelation 8, the seven trumpets, that harkens back to Jericho. And you might think about Jericho going down, Jericho's destruction as the old age, the old world. It's, it's near Jerusalem, but the old Jerusalem, the old covenant, mm -hmm. so that the new can be ushered in. Um, and, and all of this comes to a head, frankly, as we all know, on the cross. That on the cross, the world, in a real sense, came to an end. The old age, the age of the old Adam, the death and decay, it's conquered and vanquished by Jesus' atoning death. Now, wasn't there a hint uh, in the Hebrew scriptures that plan A had something to do with B's? God was going to drive out these hornets, right? Yeah, and just what we said earlier—that the, the the laws, the language about harem warfare, the language about 
kill every man, woman, and child. Those do not show up into Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 20. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not part of plan A. They're not part of when Israel comes out of Egypt. They're, it, it's, it's, and you see this, it's sort of like kind of two things coming together. The hardness of Israel's heart, their systemic sin, um, and the filling up of the iniquity of the Canaanites. It's mm -hmm. kind of those two things come to a head that lead to the point of the conquest, um, which again, doesn't make it easy for us to understand, but this is not in any way plan A. And in a real way, according to the scriptures, it's really the fruit and result of sin, yeah. which as much as we don't want to engage this, cries out for judgment. Yeah. One thing I have uh, thought about and I've shared with people before is that when, when someone will come up to me or they come up to you and they say, Jeff, I love the Bible, I love reading, it's all good, yay. But I'm just really struggling with this. You know, that, yeah. that, that, that these people, yeah, they had sin, but there was this judgment that was, that was placed upon them and, and I'm just struggling with that. I usually say to them, that's good. Yeah. You should struggle. This should bother you. This is, this is not a, uh, a children's nursery rhyme. Right. This is serious stuff. Lives were on the line. Yes. Families were on the line. Yes. It should bother you. But then what I would like to bring out is that we will all one day give an account of our lives. Judgment, in one way or another, will take place in our lives. We'll be judged by what we said, what right. we did in the body. And, and so if that bothers you in Joshua, then this should bother you more. And that is that everyone on your block will be judged one day. They'll stand before God. So how much does it bother you? Are you going to say anything? Are you going to do anything? Are you going to share the good news, the charisma with anyone? Are you going to serve the poor, so forth? Or does just that bother you right there? I mean, what I'm talking to myself. What do we fear more, physical death or spiritual death? Yeah. Right? I mean, this right here is a foreshadowing of something that has even greater consequences because... Those Canaanites that were killed, like there's no pronouncement upon the church of like that they are de facto like in hell or anything like right. that. Right. So I mean like what 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 again That's I, a I'm, good point. I'm talking to myself, but what's worse? What happened there or eternal damnation? Yeah. The eyes of faith, eternal damnation is far worse than what's going on. So so I and, and again, if we're gonna read this as Bible, as word of God, mm -hmm. it's not just about the past and it's not just a history book. It's about how is this a mirror for my life in the present? Yeah. And how can I live with that kind of urgency in mind that you're talking about? And if you go all the way to the end in the book of Acts, you'll find that there was uh, a man who was in serious sin. And what did Paul say? I'm going to turn him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh that his soul might be saved. Yeah. Exactly Second what you're saying five, right there. Yeah. But yeah. I remind you, it was the New Testament. <laughs> And it's not a, and this is the same kind of thinking behind excommunication or even, yeah. you know, the, with politicians that are pro-abortion, things like Define that. Define excommunication. Well, I mean, it's, I mean, it, it's, it, the church does not damn anyone, mm -hmm. right? The church doesn't damn anybody. It, it, it's simply recognizing a reality that's already there yeah. because a person has removed themselves from Christ and removed themselves from community with the church. And, and really that kind of language is an act of charity. It's to help the person know the gravity. You're drawing a lion in the sand showing yeah. you're not in here. It's to call them back to mm -hmm. evoke repentance and for all the other children watching so that they're not scandalized by what they're, they're seeing, that this is not okay. Um, yeah, our church, the, the ch it's, she's our mother. Mm -hmm. She's our loving mother. And, and just like as parents, like we don't punish and discipline just for the sake of it. We, we want them, we, we love them enough to speak the hard truths. And we love them just as they are, but as our friend Scott Hunt likes to say, too much to leave them that way. Right, right. I, and my dad would used to say to me uh, on that one time I needed to be disciplined, uh, <laughs> he would say to me, he would say, I, know, I, still rem I still remember it so clear. He'd say, Bub, this hurts me more than it hurts yeah, you. Yeah, you don't and, believe it at the time, I, right? I would say to him, I'd say, I'm not buying it. <laughs> this is going to hurt me a lot more than it's going to hurt it's you just, <laughs> with that fraternity paddle of yours. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so let's, we, we, we're there. And then, and then after that, it seems like we've got a piece of cake. We're going we're gonna to take the land. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got, we got the real tough city that guards the eastern flank. We're ready to go. So we're, now we're going to head further west. There's a little town called I, mm -hmm. spelled A. A-I-I. <laughs> I. 
And uh, this should be a piece of cake. Right. It should be a piece of cake. Was it a piece of cake? There was not a piece of cake. Right. There was not a piece of cake, you know. And um, then we have, a, you know, Aiken that we'll be talking about soon. And and it just it illustrates what we said earlier that Israel's strength is in her faithfulness. Mm -hmm. It's not in how she even like go back to Numbers thirteen fourteen with the spies. You know, at first um, they come, the ten come back scared, and like we don't want to go in. And then they're like, well, we changed our mind. Let's go in. And then they, they get destroyed because it's like, no, you don't do this on your own mm -hmm. terms. That's one of the grand lessons. But yeah, you're right. I um, does not go in. They were supposed to take the little city. They were defeated by the little city. And it came down to there was sin. Right. I mean, when are we going to wake up? There was sin. And they found one man by the name of Achan. Achan. And he was dealt with. And this is a hard, hard scene. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a scene that really is so, I mean, because you have Achan, who is the one responsible. But then his whole family uh, shares in the judgment that he receives. And this is that solidarity we were talking yeah. about, that kind of corporate sense. Um, it's, it's really hard here. Again, I just remind our, our listeners, um, in our audience, the flip side of this is the mystical body of Christ. The flip side of this is that our Lord, I am the vine, you're the branches. Anybody united to the vine is united to one another. So we are all connected. Mm -hmm. Our good works mm -hmm. done in Christ impact the whole body. Mm -hmm. But our sins impact others as well. Yeah. Well, they dealt with him, and he ended up taking some of the, the goods, right. idols and so forth, from, from Jericho. He hid him in his tent. And that brought this judgment upon, uh, upon him and his family, set them back as well, you know, at, the, at that point. Uh, John Paul II said, hmm. he said that there was really no such thing as private sin, you know, strictly speaking, because all sin affects all of us. You know, I, I love pressing this uh, with my students, my college students, um, men and the women. I, you think about C.S. Lewis's famous... Uh, analogy, humanity is a fleet of ships in mere Christianity. And this is really his point that, and he says, well, there's three rules for it to go well. And the first two are, well, don't collide. Each ship can't run into each other. So don't hurt anybody. Mm -hmm. And the second one is each ship's got to be seaworthy. But what he's getting at is if your motor's broken, if your ship's broken down, guess what? You will hit someone. And that, that's the thing is it, you, we may not see it, especially as moderns. We're like, oh, just don't hurt anybody. But, you know, there's lots of examples where um, I mean, the, 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 the kid who's addicted to pornography mm -hmm. from age 10 on or whatever, like this, this, that may well destroy his marriage or her marriage someday. Uh, no sin is private. None of us are an island. We are all becoming a certain kind of person along the way. And what we're doing, uh, the choices we're making, are going to impact people in our lives very soon. They really will, and even more broadly, they'll impact the entire body of Christ. Our prayers are good works, but also our sacred sins. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. Amen to that. So if we're talking about injustices, uh, people getting riled up hmm. about what happened at, at Jericho and then AI. After that, then there is this, this northern southern campaign and they basically take they basically take the land, but not utterly take mm -hmm. the land. Right. And they were on the hilltops. And everyone thinks that if you're on the hilltops, you got the advantage. But the chariots are what move down in the valleys, and yeah. so there still are Canaanites down there in the valleys, and they have to contend with, with these people. But there's a lesson. It's almost like this ongoing lesson. Jericho, sure, they were destroyed, but that wasn't a gateway to no problems at right. all. Every, every mountain we turn around, we got problems. Right. We got problems. And God is saying to them, just like back in the, will, in the desert, uh, I, I want you to know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And in the same way, God says, I want you to rely upon me. And you got all these problems around there, uh, but I want you to rely on me, you know, completely. And I think about our own lives today mm. that some people have this idea that if I give my life to Jesus, mm. I join the Catholic Church, I go to Benedictine, mm -hmm. all my problems... Temptation's gone. <laughs> all my problems are going to be gone. Right. But... 
there's still Canaanites in the land with us today, isn't there? There's Canaanites in our own heart. Yeah. Right? You might, I, I had a powerful conversion, but I soon learned that just because you put some Jesus frost in, some of the old vices are still, yeah. so then they might show up in different ways, but they're still there. And when you look at Joshua and Judges together, and, and again, Joshua, you might get the feeling that it's more positive, uh, but even Joshua, when read in its own context, taking into account the hyperbole and the war rhetoric, they don't. They don't take all of it, right? There, there are ongoing battles to the end of Joshua's life that they haven't, and they never take Jerusalem. So Joshua 15, 63 tells us they couldn't take Jerusalem, the holy city. Um, and then you get to Judges, and you see the beginning that there was faithfulness while Joshua was alive. But then when, as you mentioned earlier, you know, the next generation didn't receive that. And what the message for me, um, and I think we all know this deep down, that it's, it's not enough just to be orthodox today. It's not enough just to have the right answers. It's not enough just to, um, you know, toe the party line. Like, do we really know Jesus from the inside out? Have we really encountered the faith as a living reality? And have we imbibed it to such an extent that we can pass it on with joy um, to our own kids, our grandkids? And, and one thing I, I would say to all of us is, um, you know, we all know so many people, family members who've walked away, maybe kids who've walked away. Don't live in the past. Don't live in the past. They are God's kids, not ours. Um, surrender them to the Lord, mm -hmm. eyes moving forward. But the reality is, and we all have a mission to our dying breath. Like it's not in the past. Life is never in the rear view mirror. Um, but the reality is it's not enough just to be orthodox. It's not enough just to have the right answers. It's, we need, uh, as you mentioned, the Shema, you know, Hero is the Lord our God, Shema Yisrael. I, mm -hmm. I pray that with my students and teach them that, that Hebrew prayer. Um, to love the Lord our God with all our hearts, our lave, our lave of, um, all of who we are. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's the only thing that's going to work. Mm -hmm. Anything short is going to be some level of compromised discipleship, and it'll end up like the judges period. I would just encourage people that, you know, that if you are, have ever been bothered by this idea of Jericho and harem warfare, uh, and feel like uh, you're sensitive to injustices, mm -hmm. that that's something good to cultivate is a sensitivity to injustice. And perhaps you get angry. And when you get angry, uh, anger in itself is not bad. Uh, it is not good or bad or evil. Uh, it is a passion, a sensitive passion. And it can become bad when your passions are given over to vice, but it can become very good if your passions are given over to virtue. And if you're angry about something and you feel deeply about it, you have to ask yourself the question, is this something that I can do something about? If not, pray, let go. But if you can do something and you feel called to do it, then you do it. And a lot of ministries have started this way, yes. abortion yeah. and so forth, where people are, they are moved by the injustice in the land yes. and they want to do something right. about it. And God speaks to them and says, I want you to do something. But so often when we get angry, hmm. it's selfish. You know, it's like, you didn't bring home from the store what I wanted you to. Hmm. Or I told you to be home at seven. I don't want to be there late. You know, it's just very self-centered type of type of things. But what about this idea of being sensitive? Can we cultivate a sensitivity to injustice and and spot it immediately and ask ourselves, am I called to that or is this someone else's? someone else's deal should they be involved in it you know we, we, i mean we can and we should and we, we must cultivate that um but you're, you're alerting you know all of us to an implicit possible danger and i think for a lot of us uh again sin is always lurking at the door right uh, there's always going to be temptation but um you know i've been reading with my older kids the screw tape letters and we've been talking about okay how would if you were to write your own screw tape letters, how mm -hmm. would, if you were the evil one, how would you attack yourself? And, and the reason I bring this up is I think for a lot of us- That's a good question. Well, I, yeah, it's a really good question, but kind of personalize it. For a lot of us, we might not be drawn toward grievous sins, right? The, the money, sex, and power. Maybe, maybe that's like not, I mean, now that we've kind of walked with the Lord for a while, but how might the evil one get in our way now? Well, it could easily be distraction. Things to just rattle our peace, get us chasing things that mm -hmm. take us away from. And I think with the internet, social media, the TV, television, um, on the one hand, we've got to cultivate a sensitivity to injustice, and we should have a righteous anger, and that should move us to do something about it. At the same time, we don't want to be so 
uh, enamored with things out there that we become terrible people right here. Mm -hmm. And we and we miss out on our real our vocation in the here and now with the people we live with, our our families. Um, we don't want to get in the position where we really love people out there, but we're just jerks yeah. right here. And, and that can easily happen when we get so when we can't. It becomes like an all consuming concern. That's where I so yes, cultivate that sensitivity, but watch how it completely and totally destroys and wrecks our peace. And what does it do to our prayer life? And are we praying? Or are we just watching the news? Yeah. And we cannot substitute the one for the other. They're not the same thing by right. any means. That brings me to a point that I, I did want to discuss with you, uh, where, you know, when we read the story of uh, the conquest and the judges, there's a lot of bad things that go on during that time. And, and it's one of the periods of, of the Bible where a lot of parents will say, well, we're not going to quite get into that. Yeah. Right now, there's some really difficult, yeah. difficult things. And when you stare at the difficult things, when you contemplate these difficult things with constantly, it can wear you down. Mm -hmm. And it can, it can take the joy from you unless you begin to realize that, that God is bigger than all of this. And I'm thinking about, for example, people just sitting and watching the news every night. You know, I know people that are really good Catholics who watch four hours of network news every night, yeah. every night, and, and they're depressed and discouraged. If we're going to focus on the, the iniquity, we're going to focus on the, the sinfulness of, of society and not be a part of bringing the good news to people, it will bring you down. And I see the same news that everybody else does, but I try to counter that by sharing the good news with people and watching uh, lives change. And that brings great joy, you know, to, uh, to see that. But let's move a little bit further out just for a moment. We know about the conquest, and there's, there's actually so much that goes on there. And they end up, you know, at Mount Ebal and Gerizim, and they go over the curses of the law and the blessings of the right. law. And then Joshua dies, and we enter the book of judges and for the first time now for a long time there's no leader yeah there's no leader and it says at the beginning and at the end every the man did what was right in there in their oh, own eyes. eyes does yeah. that remind you of a country or <laughs> never right yeah because there was no king yeah i mean you get this rank relativism mm -hmm. and that's what besets us today and our, our one of our heroes saint john paul ii I mean, he really had his eye on this because he was convinced that if you're going to build a stable and just civil order, relativism is the worst thing for it. It's got to be built upon a stable moral order mm -hmm. to really have a free and just society. Yeah. So we've got this period where, and on the Bible timeline chart, you know, uh, my Bible timeline chart, I must have given it away. <laughs> but on my Bible timeline chart, the... There's a, 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 little, a little graphic there which talks about seven times around during the period of the judges, sin, mm -hmm. and that sin leads to servitude. Right. They become servants of the neighboring people. That servitude is hard, and it leads to supplication. Mm -hmm. They cry out, God, help us, help us, and it leads to salvation. Yeah. God raises up a judge and delivers he delivers his people. Sometimes there's things going on almost at the same time around there. But they, we have this salvation, and then it moves into silence. <sighs> but then when you know it, they get into sin again. And you go around the mountain again seven times in the, um, in the book of Judges. And when I read that, I think to myself, when are you guys going to get a clue? And then I look in the mirror. <laughs> and it's like, right. uh, man, that's a pattern in my, in my own life. You know, and what they're beginning to realize is that they're going to want to, they want some kind of leadership. This isn't working so well. The judges were more like, you know, kind of warriors and uh, warrior kings in a way, not kings per se, but they were leader. One, Deborah, only, only woman. Mm -hmm. But what really epitomizes this period of time is Samson. Mm -hmm. That's the guy from the tribe of Dan, the weakest tribe down in where the Gaza Strip is today in the southeast, southwest corner. And in that story of Samson epitomizes the mess that Israel is in during this period, which is going to lead up to, you know what? 
I think we need a king. <laughs> yeah. I think we need a king. I mean, what do you think about that story? Well, I mean, I, you're a guy like Samson. You're <laughs> big and strong. <laughs> it's so ironic. It's so ironic. So here you have this seemingly heroic figure in Samson. Yeah. Who basically is consecrated as a, as a Nazarite. So that the Nazarite vow, you read about number six, and he's sort of consecrated like that from the womb, mm -hmm. um, you know, as like John the Baptist. And we have a few examples of this. And part of that vow uh, is to not come into contact with a dead body, to, to avoid strong drink, alcohol, uh, and to not cut their hair. And, and, and typically it, was, it seems to have been a, a temporary thing, but, but his seems to be lifelong. But then you look at Samson and he's eating honey out of a dead lion's corpse. It's like, well, that Unplained. doesn't square with the. You know, and then he has this feast, this mishteh, which probably includes alcohol. And then, though it's through deceit, he allows Delilah to cut his hair. So it's like, you've got this heroic figure that falls short in all these different ways. And on the one hand, like this is where they are as a people. It's where we all are as yeah. a as a as a masterpiece and a work in progress at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it kind of. And then by the time you get to the end of Judges, uh, you know, with um, that Levite and the concubine. I mean, it's like this it's is awesome. in a terrible way, um, and it kind of it's kind of a seg period in that it kind of sets the stage for the rise ultimately of David and the Davidic kingdom. And we mentioned this earlier, but they never take Jerusalem in Joshua 15, 63. It's not really until David in 2 Samuel 5 that they take Jerusalem. So it's, it says in which David actually completes mm -hmm. what Joshua began. And then he brings the, David brings the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem in 2 Samuel 6. And then you have the Davidic Covenant formed in 7. And you think back, and there's a lot of different things we're talking about here, but like Deuteronomy 12, when you enter into my rest, when the land has rest, mm -hmm. not just physically from warfare, but becomes faithful. I'll choose a place for my name to dwell, and it foreshadows the temple. Um, and so there's a sense in which the David and Solomon kind of bring, as like an arc, kind of a climax of this whole movement. And in some ways, I know we're I'm bouncing around a bit, but with David and Solomon, in some ways, brings about the kind of climax of salvation history, because now you have all 12 tribes of Israel under the Davidic king, the other nations coming to worship the God of Israel and his glory dwelling in the temple. And so you look at the movement from Egypt, ultimately to the promised land, but it's the promised land, it's the holy land, because God dwells there to the temple, sort of like the ark of salvation history. Um, and then that sort of goes downhill quickly. Um, but we're kind of... That's, that's the stage for Jesus, but it's also like our lives. You know, you mm -hmm. mentioned the, the, the cycles with judges. How many times do we forget the Lord? We have an encounter, go on a retreat, big conference, mm -hmm. it lasts for a while. Life will never be the same. The buzz goes, all, it goes away, and then we find ourselves in desolation. We forget, the Lord seems silent, and we fall into other things, and then, and then we cry out, right? So I, I, there's a great line from St. Athanasius on the Psalms, that the Psalms are a mirror to our own lives. It goes through all these different mm -hmm. stages. So you might think of yourself, the story of Israel embodies humanity's story, and it embodies our story. Mm -hmm. So continue to find yourself, find ourselves in that story. It might look different, but it's there. <laughs> well, if I was to find myself in the period of the judges, I would say um, Samson is a guy that I would identify with, mm. obviously because of the my hair. strength. <laughs> my, my strength. But, and my hair when I was in high school, I could have whipped you. Okay? <laughs> the strength comes from the hair. I just want you to know. No, the I, only time you're going to hear you me You show me that. pictures. I, I know this is true. I got hair down to here. But the, the, the strength wasn't the length of his hair. It was what it stood for. And that right. was that Nazarite vow, which points to covenant. And, and this is what just really, really hits me. And you can benefit from this. And that is, she wanted to figure out how to make him like any other man. In other words, mm. he was different. Israel was supposed to be different. Israel was supposed to be holy as God is holy, consecrated, distinct, unusual. And they became more and more like yes. the neighboring nations. And he was different, bit of a clown, bit of a joker, womanizer, honey eater, all of that. But he had that relationship with God, and that begins to dwindle away. And that's covenant. Yeah. The covenant is our strength. The covenant is Israel's strength. And the, f the further we get away from the covenant relationship, the weaker we get. Yeah. 
in our lives today. And that's what happened to Israel during that time. And you can, you can kind of tell whether people see their relationship with Jesus as a, a covenant relationship, bridal spousal, or a political relationship. And the further you get away from that bridal spousal relationship, you begin to define it in political terms. Yes. I'm liberal. I'm conservative. Right. You know? Right, 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 right. And, and that isn't the way we define ourselves. Right. It's right. not the way. The way we define ourselves is faithful and unfaithful. And he became unfaithful, lost his strength. Right. And eventually his hair grew back. I mean, does the faith have political implications? Yes, of course. But does the faith go, well, I mean, we are citizens of the heavenly Jerusalem. Like, let, let's, let's keep that in mind and not get right. so hung up. Let's think with the eyes of eternity, not just with the eyes of time. Mm -hmm. um, all these things are passing. Yeah. And we do what we can, but ultimately we are on a journey, on a pilgrimage back to the heart of the Father. Yeah. Well, this has been good. The, uh, it's hard. Uh, and, and there are parts of the Bible that are hard. Yeah. And that, that is something that, it's just hard, <laughs> you know, when you're dealing with life and death and sin and faithfulness and, and mistakes and, and yeah. you know, and all of that unfaithfulness on Israel's part, things become difficult. But we can learn so much from this that God, even in the midst of it, is merciful and he loves us and he's the God of second chances. But like you mentioned earlier, way back in Genesis, the, the cup was being filled the cup of iniquity was being filled. And there came a point where God had to act. There's a lot of people saying, well, I don't know why he had to do that. Well, let's change that around a little bit. I don't know why they had to do that. And the cup was full and God brought judgment upon them. Whatever God is going to do, I'm with him. And I just want to make sure that that judgment's not going to come my way. <laughs> I'm going to be right with him. Well, I want to talk about your Bible. Uh, you know, for people who teach the Bible and pe people who are interested in Bible studies, Bibles are personal, you know? Yeah. And uh, people grow, they grow into it. It becomes a part of you. It's part of your, your victories. It's the, the sad times in your life, the mm. times where you need to be consoled and, and, uh, and times where you needed to be encouraged and hope. And yours looks like a whole lot of a, a lot of that. Tell me before we look at your Bible, how do you go about studying for yourself? Hmm. Because I know in my life, if I'm studying for a, a study, like we did Hebrews together right. and Romans, and I don't study for me like that. That's I'm trying to study as a teacher. Right. I want to make sure I've got all my ducks in a row, that I can make some points and all that. But in the meantime, I might be dealing with maybe a dry period, you know, in my life. Right. And I'm going to get into the Word of God. So how do you do it? Do you have a, you have a regime, re, you know, re, regimen? Or? Yeah, no, what you, you mentioned is, I think for any serious student in the Bible, there's going to come a time where there's a danger of it, making it uh, an idea, making it merely study, making it merely look what I know. Uh, and um, I guess maybe just to, as a preface uh, to your question, I think about the great figures of Thomas, mm -hmm. um, Peter, John, the beloved disciple, and, and kind of embody, and I got this from, from others along the way, that you know, Thomas kind of embodies the rational streak in us. I won't believe until I can see. Uh, John is so mystical, kind of, you, know, you might think devotional. Uh, and then Peter, so apostolic, out there, mission, right? Uh, I think we're at our best, the church and each of us, when those three are all woven together, right? So and we're, we all probably maybe gravitate toward a, a Thomas, the rational, the study, John, the devotional, uh, Peter, the let's go out and do something. Uh, but I think we, we, need, we need all three. So um, prayer-wise, one thing that I'd encourage people to do, and I, I, I've done for a long time, is I will read the liturgical readings. Um, By that, you, you mean the gospel the, of the day? And, yeah, so you know, I, and I'll often, I mean, so I, I will often read the psalm in Hebrew and the gospel in Greek. And, that, um, and not just to study Hebrew or Greek, but to um, kind of chew on that. And, and it helps my heart beat with the rhythm of the church, the liturgical cycle, the mm -hmm. liturgical year. Mm -hmm. um, so for like prayer time and devotional time, I'll often use the, the lectionary readings, uh, often the psalm and the gospel, depends on what they are. Sometimes I'll bounce around a little bit. Um, it's a great thing to do if you also go to daily mass. Because now you've read the readings mm -hmm. once and you're, you, you know, the mass brings together the table of God's word and the table of the, 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 the risen body of our Lord, his body, mm -hmm. blood, soul, and divinity. Uh, and the one leads to the other. So 
that's been a powerful thing. I, I also like to have time where I'm just working through a book and working, uh, and, and, and it's, as you know, it's one thing to prep for a class. It's one thing to prep for teaching. Yeah. It's something just to enter God's word on your own. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm at my best when I'm not just prepping for class. I'm just immersing myself, doing, you're bringing Thomas and John and Peter together. I'm studying, I'm rolling up my sleeves. I've got dictionaries and encyclopedias and maps out and Hebrew and Greek, but I'm also getting lost like a child. And the word of God and the, the living word of God is not just a dead letter about the past, but because here's the thing, um, the same spirit that inspires the text guides the church and dwells in you and me. Right. And so that synergy right there uh, is really the bridge between the there and then and the here and now. So God can speak to me this moment, this day. Everybody wants to know from someone like you and Sarah, how do you get your children into scripture? Yeah. Because you've got a lot of children. You're a Bible scholar. Yeah. Your wife is a teacher. She's a speaker yeah. as well. And some way, one way or another, you guys are going to influence them in Scripture. Yeah, which is, uh, you know, one, uh, this isn't a, a main way, but just this past semester, um, I taught a, a Bible class for the homeschool group in town. And I had my two sons and uh, 16 and so, just turned 16 and 17 and uh, their friends. So it's great to kind of minister to them and their friends and walk them through salvation history, but also... <laughs> Try to pierce their heart. Um, a couple of things we've done throughout the years um, with Jesse Tree during Advent. It's a great time. And there's different things you can get um, to kind of go through the story of salvation history. Uh, and to do that liturgically, I think, is a good, is a good move. I, I, it's been, depending on the age of the kids, I, I don't know that I would begin with just like Genesis. Like you think about Advent. We go back with we're Israel yearning for our Messiah, mm -hmm. getting ready for the birth of Messiah. And then we celebrate the birth. You, you know, you have Christmas and the Epiphany and then the ba baptism. And then you move toward, obviously, Lent. And now we're moving toward, you know, we're out in the wilderness with Jesus. As Jesus recapitulates Israel's story, we are entering into the life of Christ, into the Passion, and then uh, Ascension and Pentecost and all that. So I think that's a... And at three or four, five years old, they get that, huh? Well, I mean, <laughs> well, the thing is, I think back to what we said earlier, you know, it's not enough just to be orthodox. Uh, and I think with parenting too, and this is for all of us, right? Um, we don't want to just teach the right truths. We don't even want to just do the right actions. We want to train the heart to actually desire the right things. And I think the liturgical life of the church and these sort of practices, the rosary has been an important one, and it's hit or miss depending on the age sure. of the kids and whatnot. Um, and day to day, it, you know, not every day is the same. Not every day is the same. Sometimes it's a decade. Sometimes, I mean, you know, yeah. but it helps to kind of like let that seep in. Uh, not just, a, and it sort of is like tilling the ground for catechesis later on. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd say a lot of that has been the focal point as opposed to systematic Bible teaching yeah. until they've gotten older. And they all have their various versions of the kids' Bibles. And, and, and um, you know, Ascension's got some great products too for kids that kind of go through the story of salvation. Uh, well, history. the way you and Sarah are, are going and you're both having an influence in the body of Christ, we just imagine that, the, that your kids are saying, Daddy, please read it in Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> well, they might make fun of me. Uh, yeah, they might to, 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 to mock me, you know. Okay. I mean, they're, they're, they're great. They're great. But they're, they're you know, all, I think the task for all of us, you mentioned Israel, is to be normal but different. Yeah. yeah right? So, uh, I mean, my kids have the same, you know, goofy struggles. That, uh, but but there, there's also a difference. And I think all of us, you know, we're in the world, not of the world. Normal builds the bridge. But if there's not a difference in us, we mm -hmm. won't move the needle for evangelization. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's probably a question you get, you know, about your kids. I get it about my kids. Scott hung out about his kids, and Ted gets it about his kids, you know, and, and that type of thing. Now, I want to talk to you about the Bibles that you brought here because I, I need to know right off the bat, do these double as um, chairs to sit on for the little kids at dinner? <laughs> yeah, so I, uh, you know, uh, if we do a little show and tell Can I touch here. touch it? Yeah, oh, yeah, it might, it might bite. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> you might help me with that. <laughs> so this is the one I. This is what I. <laughs> and this is. And how many Bibles are in here? So that's the Old Testament, with Hebrew and English facing, uh -huh. and that's what I teach out of for my Old Testament classes. Um, <laughs> now I know how you do it. Now this I know. This is right. This is the old man workout. Right. Man, that is. That is really. 
it, you know, we got the Something. got the black tape around. But yeah, I, I just, I mean, I like to teach from it because then I can. It's got Hebrew and English. That's can, why it's so big, right? Right. I have the English on one side, the Hebrew on the other. And so when students ask, "What's that word? What's going on there?" You know, I can, I can show them. And then I have the um, for the New Testament, the same thing. But wait a minute. Okay, yeah. So I have the Greek and the English on uh, each side, and it's a lot wow. to lug around. I've got you know duct tape around it. Uh, let, let me just get this here. Yeah. I just gotta show people. <laughs> this. Is his Old and New Testament, okay? That's why he's got the, the, the guns he has. This is mine. Look at the difference there. The difference is it's all inside of you, Jeff. You, you don't even need to turn to the page. <laughs> You're the living word. Well, there's that. No, <laughs> that, is, that is amazing. That is really, really something. Do you have other Bibles at home, too? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I got these about five, six, seven years ago, and it's kind of like a purse, you know. I mean, uh, you know, and I, we talked to <laughs> I students. never thought of it that way. Well, but. I mean, because I, you know, I, I want to have these. I always need to have a marker, a highlighter, yellow highlighter, mm -hmm. fat one, and a, and a pen, usually a blue pen. Uh, I just can't, I can't read scripture without those. And I know sometimes people have trouble marking up the <laughs> Bible and things like that. And I encourage students, like, just... I mean, you want to be reverent and respectful. Yeah, you don't mark your Bible. You actually paint it, don't you? <laughs> you paint the pages. Look, show me, show me a page. I want, I want, oh, I want our friends to see this. <laughs> <laughs> there we are. There we are. Now, what happened there? Well, you know, it's sort of like faded jeans. You can buy it that way, right? Yeah. Uh, I, it, it's, um, you know, you see, as you know, every time you go back through the sacred page, you see more things, yeah. more connections personally. Literarily, uh, the life of the church, life, the movement of scripture, things connected. Um, I've just never been shy about about diving in like that. And I have, I have my. So what I like about this Bible is I has a lot of room for notes. Yeah, and I, so know, I, I, I like. I appreciate yeah. that. That's. I think it's great to see a guy that uh, loves studying the Bible. And I mean, you got a long way to go before the Lord takes you. But, but one day, your kids and your grandkids are going to see your tools, the Word of God, and think, "Wow." Papa was really into the Bible, wasn't See, he? See, that's how I justify the book budget to my wife, Sarah, right? It's like, well, you know, if I were a farmer, I would need like a combine and all it's so, We'll know. edit that part out. <laughs> I know, because I use the same one. So. so what do you use to mark? Do you have a system? Do you have a system or is it just whatever's around you? Do you use markers, crayons, yeah. pens? What do you use? I, I use a yellow highlighter and a blue pen. Uh, that's kind of my, my go-to and... Um, you know, I typically, now it sometimes gets a little haphazard, but um, try to uh, really important things get highlighted. Uh, something I want to take note of, but maybe aren't as significant, underline. And if it's really important, I highlight and underline and circle. And, you know, I guess what it does is it helps me to find things when yeah, I'm teaching. Yeah, that's the same um, with me. This was my first one when I was 18, and I wanted one like Mrs. Tobler. So I went to uh, uh, I went to the store and, and bought one, and I actually came up with a kind of a system, but the mm. system fell apart really, really, really quick. That's yeah. this was the first Bible. That's beautiful. That 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 I had. That's Ephesians. The straight uh, lines. This is one that really got messed up. That's Corinthians. And you know why it got messed up? Because I didn't know that yellow markers bled through yeah. India paper. <laughs> yeah. So when I marked chapter 13 in 1 Corinthians, it got yep. 14 and 15 <laughs> <laughs> on the other side there. But I go back into my Bible here, and I even have at the very front, I've got a complete description of Emily coming home from work, and she's having contractions, mm. our firstborn. Oh, wow. And I, I took a whole page and wrote down the That's whole, beautiful. all the way to the delivery. And I, I look at that now, and of course, kids get a kick out of finding themselves in your Bible. And That's beautiful. They had all kinds of blank pages in the front, so I wrote, mm. you know, all kinds of, all kinds of fun things. All right. So your favorite person in the Bible? Who do you, I won't say favorite, but who do you identify with the most in the Bible? Oh, identify with? Well, I, yeah. Mm, I might say Peter. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm all in, Lord. Oh, I just fell. And then the, <laughs> I love that scene in Luke where, you know, the Last Supper of the courtyard, and he makes. Jesus looked at Peter, eye contact, and Peter wept. And um, so I think probably Peter, just the zeal, just the kind of all over the place. Um, I also love Ruth. I love what an unlikely convert. That's the know. first one for us. We've never had Ruth. Is that right? I mean, yeah. I, the Moabite, she becomes the, you know, such a, 
I think for so many in our time, probably in every time, life is a story with no plot. Uh, the, 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 there's no meaning, right? Yeah. You, you find a way to give your life meaning. And the thing is, we just, we're all, we, what we long for is meaning we receive from the Lord. We're all part of this great story. We're part of salvation history. Like it's not, it hasn't stopped yet, mm-hmm. but we just don't know the full impact of our lives. And, and think about little Ruth, this small bite, marries into this family. She becomes the great grandmother of King David. I mean, there's just her faithfulness. And, and she is referred to as an Asheth Chayil. Uh, which is the same word in Proverbs 31.10, the godly wife, the Asheth Chayil. Um, and, and I just, yeah, so I, I mean, I could think of others, but but I just love Ruth as the unlikely convert from Moab. Yeah. Uh, it's during the time of the judges, mm-hmm. um, this great beacon of faithfulness behind the scenes that no one really notices, but is a mover and shaker of salvation history. And how many of our people today in our audience are actually, in truth, the real movers and shakers of salvation history, yeah, and they may not realize it, but they are. And she's in the genealogy of Matthew. You know, there she is, one of the, one of the ladies. Good. Well, you want to raise for some questions? Sure, that sounds great. And we're going to start off with Timothy. Timothy asks Doctor Swafford, mm-hmm. "What exactly was Joshua's role for the, for the people of Israel? Was he a prophet, a captain, or something mm-hmm. else?" Now. That's a good question because we kind of get an idea who Moses is and Isaiah and everybody, but Joshua, what, what was he? I think the best way to, th- I mean, that's a really good question, uh, is to think of him, frankly, as a new Moses figure, right? So Numbers 27, mm. he's commissioned by Moses. Moses through the laying on of hands and Moses bequeaths his authority to Moses. And you look at the early chapters of Joshua, there's a lot of parallels between Joshua and Moses. And so I, I would say the book of Joshua presents Joshua as a new Moses figure, which is Partly priestly, prophetic, though we don't think of Joshua that way as much, but as a new Moses figure, that would make sense. But also he's sort of leading them um, in battle. The connection to Jesus' name, too, uh, and again, Greek readers, early Christians saw this with, when they would read their Greek Bibles, the same name for Jesus shows up for Joshua. So Yahushua, mm-hmm. which means God saved. So kind of a, I mean, a savior figure in a different way. Yeah. Um, and one thing we didn't get to earlier, you know, the manna is given after the Exodus, but then when they get the Promised Land, Joshua 5.12, the manna ceases. Right. Just as Jesus brought us through a new Exodus, and we have the new manna, the Eucharist, and when we get to the new Promised Land, heaven, heaven itself, uh, even though the sign right now is the reality, the Eucharist is Jesus, it'll give way to face-to-face communion. Yeah. So, so yeah, I, I, new Moses, um, and think about all that goes with that, but also a foreshadowing Jesus who fights our battles, goes into the wilderness, fights, you know, the temptation scene. Um, Again, just like we've been saying, see those earthly struggles as embodying and foreshadowing the heavenly battles that our Lord fights for us and that we have to fight with him. And Joshua begins his public ministry right there at the Jordan. Jesus begins his public ministry in Matthew 3 and 4, right there. At the Jordan. At the Jordan, at 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 the same place. Yeah. And we look at Joshua 3 and 4, when they cross the Jordan, it's it's, it's, uh, it's explained in a way that parallels the crossing of the Red Sea. Yeah. So it's sort of like the completion of the Exodus. Good, good. So it's kind of a, kind of a new Moses. Mm-hmm. That's, that's good. Luke asks, why wasn't anyone circumcised mm-hmm. while the Israelites wandered in the desert? Now, that's a question that's in, insightful there, Luke, because a lot of people didn't even know that. Yeah. You know, they weren't paying attention uh, to that. But once they did come into the land, they were circumcised. I mean, I think I have a pretty simple answer, but I think it's probably not different than why some people growing up maybe didn't have their first communion and didn't get confirmed that, you know, what, what the book of Numbers, as you know, Jeff, and the Hebrew name of that book is in the wil- by Midbar, yeah. right? In the wilderness. And they're in the wilderness physically, but they're also in the wilderness spiritually. So my take on that is they're just, it's, it's a sign of their spiritual desti- you know, destitute state, um, that it wasn't a priority and they didn't do it. And... It's a sign of ominous things to, to come. And, you know, neglecting these practices um, is a sign of a deeper neglect of the faith. Okay, Regina, why did Israel have to partake in so many battles mm-hmm. and warfare to attain the promised land? It doesn't seem right that the chosen people of God would act in this way. So now I'll throw that question to you, but it in some ways is coming from a modern mindset, Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, one of the things that we're seeing on the news recently 
uh, when we're talking about Iraq and the Middle East, is that in some of these cultures, there's literally what they call the season of war. There is actually a time of the year where they war, you know, and, and, uh, and uh, the, the, the nations that are surrounding Israel are warring nations. And uh, when they take the promised land, there is a battle. There is a battle that uh, has to be won there. I mean, a great, great, great question. In some ways, it's kind of the whole episode mm-hmm. we've been talking about. Um, I, you know, let me just use Ezekiel just briefly here. You think, look at Ezekiel 40 to 48. Ezekiel's book ends with this depiction of this eschatological temple um, that is ultimately pointing to the risen Christ and the church mm-hmm. as the, right? But it's given in so much detail. Um, and now, why? Well, because the revelation is given to the people in a way that they can understand. And, and God encounters people in time and space. He doesn't just drop down an idea. He doesn't just say, here's some platonic philosophy for you. He encounters people in, in time and in history. And so that, what that means then in Scripture is there's a, there's a historicity, not just that it happened, but a, a conditionness. It, it bears the marks of the time period. Um, as you said, so too does Joshua. Uh, Ezekiel, uh, in that, that whole temple, yes, very detailed, very concrete, all these specifications. But then you have the living water flowing from the sanctuary in chapter 47, and it flows into the Dead Sea and makes all things come to life. And so you look at Jesus and the church, does it fulfill Ezekiel's prophecy? In real way, it overfills it. It, it's, it surpasses it, um, but it's given to Ezekiel and it, to Ezekiel's people, Ezekiel's time, in a way that they can understand. I think analogously, Joshua, or God, the, our Lord, through Joshua, is speaking to a people in a very different context than our own. And I think we have to take that into account and recognize this is not like a once for all, do this always and everywhere. It's, no, God is meeting his people at a time, at a certain time and place mm-hmm. where they're at to lead them to the goal. So always, ha- when you read this, again, this is a part of the journey, but you have to read it in light of where the journey's going, which is Christ and mm-hmm. Christ crucified and risen. I often present it this way. Um, how how does Scripture, and with our Lord, for example, how does he speak to his time period and through it and beyond it? How does the Bible, whether it's Joshua or whatever, how does it speak to its time period, but also through it and beyond it? To kind of have that frame of reference and not be afraid of the fact of the, of the Bible having uh, earmarks of its own day. Because frankly, that's, those are signs of its historicity. These things really happened. This yeah. didn't happen on Middle Earth. This really happened. And there's marks of its own time period. But because God is provident, because God is the author, it speaks to that time period and through it and beyond it uh, to our Lord and the age to come, and even to each one of us right now. So uh, hopefully that helps a little bit. But that, yeah. that, that's what we're afraid of is the, the kind of historical nature of it. Yeah. You think you think God's word is going to be Shakespeare coming out. <laughs> it's going to be Plato coming out. It's going to be Cicero. No, God but there's is, a grittiness. There's a God human God is not point. above the clouds. He is below the clouds with us. Yes. You know, it's the, incarnational. Both the Greek and the, and the Roman gods right. are out there taking advantage yeah. of us. Okay. Um, Macy. Macy uh, writes, what? are the cities of refuge? Hmm. Now, that's a good question because, again, a lot of people don't know what a city of refuge is, right. when it was, and what, what the purpose of it was. So I give that question to you. It's kind of like the um, you know, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, which, again, as moderns, we're like, This ah. is in the Old Testament. Yeah, we're like, that's terrible. But, but like, the whole idea of that law, the lex talionis, is to prevent escalation prevent, like, you know, you did this to me, and so I kill your family, you kill my tribe, I kill your village, and we're just going back and forth, and it just keeps going, this blood feud. So the cities of refuge are these six Levitical cities where basically, um, now if you committed cold-blooded murder, that was a capital crime. But let's say something happened, there was an altercation, and inadvertently someone died, mm-hmm. what we would call manslaughter, things like that. Um, basically, the person who was part of that altercation could go to a city of refuge and could actually um, be safe and uh, protected until you could have legal proceedings and an actual you know, verdict and the like. And, and so again, what's the point of it? The point of it is to prevent that blood feud escalation, right? So um, revenge. Y- you, you swung the axe too hard. It killed my brother and I'm going to kill your family and we're going to go back and forth. And so the city of refuge is designed to kind of squelch and keep at bay that kind of blood feud escalation uh, by having a place to go to find refuge and sanctuary, not to like get off free if you did something wrong, but to have an actual trial. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Tiffany, why did the tabernacle end up in Shiloh mm. for a time? 
That's also a, a, a very good question, Tiffany. It was uh, it was there. I think it was about 100, about 369 years. It was at Shiloh mm -hmm. before David brings it into right. into uh, Jerusalem. But I guess the question is, why there? Why Shiloh? <laughs> well, I don't know if I have a good answer for that. I mean, I, I would see that. So Deuteronomy 12, we mentioned, is that prophecy that is ultimately fulfilled in the Jerusalem temple, that when you come into my rest, I'll choose a place for my name, my presence to dwell among you, a kind of a permanent sanctuary. Uh, and I would say Shiloh is a sort of partial fulfillment of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was just reading through the Hebrew recently in 1 Samuel 3, it does use the word heikal, which is often the word for temple, to describe that. Um, and it seems to be more permanent than the tabernacle, but not as grand as the temple. Um, but I, yeah, I, I don't know why exactly Shiloh. Shiloh is kind of in the middle of Israel. Um, you know, if you look at the whole of the Bible, God wants to dwell with us. I mean, Eden is sort of a sanctuary. Uh, and then when you look at the Revelation, like 21, 27, that in this heavenly Jerusalem, there is no temple because God is all in all. So mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's just a step on the road of God dwelling with his people. And not too um, far from Jerusalem. Not too far from Jerusalem. You know? Yeah. Uh, it's cent like you said, it's centrally located, just north of Jerusalem. Uh, the tribe that that it is in is is significant. So, but th there are questions like that mm. that are good. I, and even though you don't have an answer, Tiffany, a complete answer like uh, all scholars say this or right. that, it's a good question, and it might be one that you can dig into, you know, more yourself. And that's one of the things I found in the Word of God is that you can't exhaust it. Mm -hmm. You know, you can ask questions, and that's that's the key to learning, isn't it? Yes. Keep asking questions. It's not the man who has all the answers, but the man who knows the right questions. Yeah, that's exactly that's, right. That's what really really matters. So yay for for Tiffany. Well, this has been fantastic uh, to share with you, and and to uh, I, I you pro you probably teach like you played football, you know, and you probably played football hard, didn't you? And, you really gave it everything you had. Uh, I think this is a true statement. <laughs> <laughs> and I've seen you, yeah. you teach, you're, you're very intense yeah. about that and very, very, very good. What a, a great place for you to be is on a college campus. Oh, it's it's a blessing. And I, sometimes I have to pinch myself. I can't believe that they pay me to, to, to do this, I know, right? I mean, it's, I uh, it, yeah, I mean, uh, it's great to be at the alma mater, but to kind of see students at that pivotal age in life, yeah. you know, 18 to 22, where they're kind of going to set the trajectory of the rest of their lives and to kind of, Help them get to know our Lord and give their lives to the Lord and not be afraid. Right? Do not think of yourself and your value as what letters are behind my name. Sure. Just don't buy into all that nonsense. Just, just get into the Word. And when you get into the Word, you'll become a teacher, whether formally or not. People are going to want to hear about your study and your encounter with the Lord. Uh, so we need more the merrier. I mean, we just need all the Catholics to have the Catechism and the Bible and just... I mean, that's what will set this yeah. place ablaze. Yeah. Man. Amen. Would you mind closing us out in prayer? I'd love to. I'd love to. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks and praise and honor and glory. We just thank you for bringing each and every one of us to a time such as this, that you have called us, you have commissioned us, you have chosen us, you have loved us into existence, and each and every one of us has a part to play in your great story. Lord, I just pray that you may come into each one of our hearts and minds and give us that parousia, that boldness of the gospel, uh, that we are here for a purpose. Give us the strength to be not afraid, to be convicted with passion and purpose. Uh, and we just pray for the families of all of our audience, of everybody here, uh, that you may step into the gap, even where things look like they're going badly, like they're going south, like we just can't, can't fix this. Uh, Lord, give us that door of hope. We ask all this through Christ, our King and Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching. If you would like to see more amazing content on the Bible, be sure to like and subscribe.